Step three, shock absorbers. These shock absorbers are actually from the Hyper 7 Pro R. Uh, they're not big bore shocks, they're just regular width. Um, the only thing that differentiates them from the standard Hyper 7 is that they're anodized in this pinky purpley color. And as you can see, this rear shock has been exposed to the muffler side. So, being coated in oil and nitro fuel over the years, it's lost its anodized color coating. But other than that, they've held up pretty well. One thing I will add is that plastic is not the best material as it's fully exposed to dirt and rocks and concrete. And when you roll, you will wear them out. So if you want to look after these, you'll have to put some protective covers on them, perhaps some silicon ones from the cheap Chinese websites, or make up something yourself, or just have something higher on the shock tower than the, um, the shock caps. These boots normally wear out as well. Um, they crack and so forth, especially when they're exposed to nitro fuel. Uh, but when they're new, they're great. And uh, if they do wear out, you can always use a balloon uh, instead of buying those rubber silicon ones. Alright, so we've got the fronts with the small spaces. And then we've got the longer rears, the longer springs and the thicker spaces. So let's start putting these together. So we get a front and then we put a spacer. Then we put the retainer, then we put the spring, and then we put the bottom retainer. Another front, spacer, spring retainer, spring, Now the rear, put your two spaces on, one, two, and then your retainer, then your spring, Spacer, spacer, retainer, spring, retainer. And that's step three, shocks. Remember to put your balls in, use your shock pliers there to put your balls in.
front gearbox. Step four, one. You grab the input shaft, you put a bearing on it, you put it through the case, you put another bearing on it, and then you apply pressure to the, to the gears of the input shaft as you slide on the out drive, and then do up the set screw with blue Loctite. Then you can insert your differential. Okay, so we've got everything ready to go here. So as per the step, we grab our input shaft, we put our, our bearing on it. So input shaft or differential pinion, and then we put it into the case. So to know which case I'm working on, I just labeled it with a little F there for front. Okay, push that in. Then, on the other side, we put the other bearing. Okay. All the way through. And then, with a bit of blue Loctite, we're going to do it up. But remember to push on your input shaft okay. while you do up your grub screw. Because uh, if you don't, if you don't put pressure and you just do up the set screw anywhere, you could have this movement and you don't want to play in, in high stress areas. Okay, so we've got a drop of lock type. Find out where the flat spot is. So the flat spot is there. Put the pressure on. Slide it over. That's it. No movement. Nice and tight. And then you can put your differential. Now this one here, I can see a little a little seven there, and that means I filled that up with seven thousand silicon oil, which is great for a front diff on a nitro buggy. Okay, so we got the. Uh, the crown gear on the left. Okay, so all we we need it now is a bit of uh, grease on this crown gear before we put the case together. Okay, step four point two. Make sure you've greased up your differential crown gear before installing your gearbox and uh, you can see that there's a 3x14 flathead tapping screw times two of them one for the uh, the upper support and one for the lower support uh, bulkhead nice aluminium piece on the front and uh, so we've got those pieces here ready to go let's start working on that one So we've got to first of all put some grease on our differential. We've got some Tamiya anti-wear grease here. Because uh, we don't want this to wear out. We want this to last a long, long time.
just got grease all over my three dollar tripod. Anyway. I'm going to keep this on the left. Crown gear on the left. Okay, how does that feel? Hmm, yeah. crunchy, just like my cornflakes. Yeah, I don't mind that it's a bit thick. It'll give good protection and uh, it'll stop the wheels from turning it at idle. A bit of resistance. Let's put the uh, cap on. Okay, and uh, next step, put this one on the front, pointing down. The lug needs to point down. 3x10 tapping screw first. Okay, that doesn't need to be tight, it's just holding it in position. Now on the other side, we've got this one facing up. Uh, with a 3x14 flathead tapping. Three by fourteen flathead tapping. Just doing that up finger tight. And then the other one angled up like that with another three by fourteen flathead tapping, uh, which I actually don't have, but fifteen. Close enough. Okay. Then we can put our longer screws through. So these ones go on the top. ones go on the bottom get our nuts okay so what you do is you push the nut in which pushes the screw out and then as the screw comes out, you hold the you hold the nut in and do it up, and then you feel it bite. So again, you hold the nut in, and then it will bite. You come to visit Papa. You're gonna help me build a car. Okay, you can sit on my lap. Step 4.3. We are putting the shock towers onto the front gearbox. We're using 4x13 tapping screws, four of them, 
and we're attaching steel shock balls with M3 by 16 looks like cap head machine screws. Let's do that step now. Line up the camera where we want it. Okay. Get the front gearbox. Face it towards us. Line up the shock tower. Put in the tapper. Okay, use the hex driver to start the first few threads. And then we'll finish off with the electric driver. That's Papa's. Where's Jojo's? Ah, there's a bird. Yeah. Good boy. You gonna work on your truck? Good boy. Now, if you don't have three by sixteen cap head metric screw, use three by fourteen because you don't want this screw to be longer than this steel ball because then you'll never get your shocks off easily so I'm using 3 by 14 Good job. but it seems 3 by 16 is correct Step 4.4, you need to do your front uh, axle assembly. Now you need a CVD swing shaft, but mine are all in pieces because I did a full strip. So what I'm going to do is reassemble those, which is pretty straightforward. Just put the barrel through and the pin and then do your grub screw. And uh, I guess one of the most important things is make sure you put your blue Loctite on your grub screw. Because if these come out, you'll make a mess. So we put the barrel through the dog bone. We put the dog bone into the axle. We put the pin through. And then the barrel has got a thread. And the pin has got a flat side. So the grub screw with our blue Loctite on there needs to hit the flat side of the pin. Oh, we've grabbed the wrong size grub screw. Oh. 
We've grabbed the wrong size grub screw again. Stuff comes out. Now, when working on your tractor, the tool selection is of critical importance because you can use a hex driver or you can use a flathead like that or you can use a Phillips head like this one. There's so many choices just to do the same job. So you've got to use the right tool for the right job. All right, Jojo, show them how it's done. Good boy, show us how it's done. Step 4.4, we're doing the, the front hub. Okay, so we've got the pieces here ready to go. Let's start doing the front hub. So we're gonna get the knuckle. Okay. And one is labeled left. Okay. So since this one is labeled left, we can start putting the bearings through it. So we'll put one bearing in. And then we'll get our other bearing. So this is good for installing bearings, checking bearings, and removing bearings. And it was only about $7. One of the best tools I ever bought. Okay, so now that we've got the bearings in, we have to put the knuckle collars in, which is like a uh, some kind of flange washer, I guess. Uh, and they go through the C-Hub. So that's the right C-Hub, that's the left C-Hub. So we got one goes through this side. And we got one goes through that side. Okay. And then once that's in, what we do we slide the knuckle in between those two collars okay and then we use our 4 by 12 millimeter cap head that's our 4 by 12 millimeter cap head and we put our 4 by 8 millimeter washer on there we get our biggest 3mm X driver. Mm, mm, mm. Now these ones here actually do need some blue Loctite on there. Yeah, you dropped it. Now, if you don't have... If you don't have 4x8 washer, you can use 4x9 but you can only use 4 by 9 on the top side. It won't work on the bottom side.
So I'm not going to over tighten these because I'll let the Loctite do the work. Just do them up snug and that's enough. I want to be able to get these off one day. Okay, so that's left side. Keep your hands clean, keep your parts clean, otherwise you're just going to get dirt sticking to everything. Alright, so then we can uh, push the axle through. Oh no we can't. You can't, you've got to put the axle through first. Okay, let's, let's undo it. Good boy. Okay, back to where we were. You coming with Papa? Okay. All right, now, where were we? We were taking this apart because we made a mistake. We forgot to put this through first. Okay, so you put that through first. Then you put that through here. Okay. This is the left side. Some more Loctite. Don't drop the parts on the floor anymore. Okay. Now, we've got to use our 3 by 8 millimeter round head screw, which is button head screw, okay, to complete it. So we get the left, the left one, okay, goes like this. It's just a bit of protection. It's a bit of protection for the left side. Pull. Pull. We get our two screws. Okay. 
Dada. Come Dada. Come Left and right hub assemblies are done. We can move on to 4.5, uh, the rest of the front arms. All right, step 4.5, finish off the front arms. So we put our, this is supposed to be M3 by 22 cap head machine screw, uh, but I couldn't find a, uh, a 22, so I'm just using a 20. We'll see if that works. Okay, so we'll get our driver on this side. Oh yeah, that's worked perfectly. 20 mils is fine. So we'll do the same for the other side. Come from the front. Come back to that one. Keep going with this one. So we get our arms. Okay, so that would be left because that's the uh, the scratch side. And this drops down into there, and then we get our thirty nine mil shaft. just a matter of putting two small e-clips on the ends. Uh, this is probably the most hated part of, of RC is e-clips, but uh, I'm using my Tamiya tool, uh, which makes it a little bit easier. So we put the e-clip on. Not very, not very easy. What about plies? Oh, plies are heaps easier. Okay, put that on. Okay, so we've got the e-clip on that side.
Now that's the sound of a bid. Whoa, we got like over two hundred dollar of bonus interest from ING. Bonus interest credit and interest credit. And can you see those?
underneath this part. So step four talks about the 17 degree C hub, okay, which has the little plastic covers over the C hub, which are here, little plastic covers over the C hub. But there's an optional step if you want to do 19 or 22 degree C hubs, then you just use the single piece. So if you look at the steps, for 19 or 22 it's just a single piece there's no little covers to screw on you just put the 19 or the 22 degree C hub let's get our differential ready for step 5.1 the rear transmission we'll start by putting some grease onto our differential Okay, so the three, the three here, you can just see the three there. That means I've used 3000 weight silicon oil for the rear differential, which is less than half what I've used in the front. In the front I've used seven, because I need more traction, uh, more, more bite in the front, in the corners. And the rear, I would prefer the rears to spin up uh, coming out of the curves rather than power sliding and losing control. Okay, that's done. 5.1 rear transmission. Let's put the diff into the transmission case. Okay. So we get our input shaft, put the bearing on. Put it through. The 
in on the other side. Just put the bearing on there. Now, similar to before, you've got to put the grub screw while holding some pressure onto that pinion. So slide it on, keep the pressure on while you put your, and I've already got the Loctite on there, 5x5 five five set screw, and make sure that that grub screw is on the flat spot of that diff pinion. Okay. It's on the flat spot and it's sticking out ever so slightly, but that's okay. And then remember, the crown gear goes on the left side, always. I've already put my anti-wear grease on it. And then just put the cover on. And you're done. And now step 5.2. Let's start uh, with the rear transmission case and seal it up with the, uh, the uh, brace support bulkhead and the aluminium piece hinge pin retainer. Okay, so we'll just look for that, see if we can find that piece. Come back when we can. I was looking for a purple piece, but actually it's aluminium, but it's black. So now we can continue. Okay. So we've got our sealed unit like that. And then on the front, we're going to have this guy facing down with our 14 millimeter screw. No, it's got to be the 10, 10 millimeter button head tapping. So we just do on that finger tight. Okay. And then we put our massive long screws all the way through. That's our 62.5 millimeter screws all the way through. And then on the back, we've got this guy facing up. And we put our nuts in there. Oop, we grabbed the small nuts, but actually we need the large nuts. And that was a silly mistake. One, two, three, four. So we push the large nut in. Push the large nut in, and then we can start screwing this guy up. Hold the nut as you do it up until it bites, and then you don't have to hold the nut anymore. Hold the nut until it bites. You don't have to hold the nut anymore. Okay, so now the box is secure. We can start doing the other pieces. So we've got this upright here. Goes in the back there. We can put our short screws through the front. Put our large nuts in, push that down, 
push that down. Hold the nut in until it bites. Do it up. Hold it in until it bites. Do it up. Okay. Don't forget. Don't forget these tapping screws. Not that they do anything. Just put them in anyway. I mean, look, that's already in. This is the, the screw is doing nothing. It's not even the right screw. Okay, that's done. 5.3 rear shock tower onto the rear transmission. Let's do that now. Rear trans. Shock tower. Okay. Put that on top. Four by thirteen tapping. Four by thirteen button head tapping. Three by twelve button head tapping into the wing mount. Three by sixteen. Into the long shock ball.
3 by 20 into the flange bowl. Now, this flange ball is so short that why would I use such a long screw, 3 by 20 Okay, why wouldn't I just use 3 by 13 or 3 by 12 Not too sure why it tells you to use a, a 20 millimeter screw, but I'm just going to use a, a 12. Okay, and the good thing about the 12 is it doesn't stick through. Okay, if it doesn't stick through, that means you can put the parts on, you can take the parts off. Okay, so a bit of a shame that it's button head on this side and it's cap head on this side. What can you do? The good thing about cap head screws is it gives you a chance to use a larger bit size driver. Now this, this screw is sticking through just ever so slightly. Step 5.4 is attaching the wing stay to the rear transmission, which is becoming the rear clip. So we need the wing stays and the braces, the plastic washers, the, uh, the wing pieces and the 24mm by 4 tapping screw and six of the 3x12 button head tapping screw. So let's go and do that now. Put this a bit higher. So what we've got to do is put the braces in. One, two, three. Okay, and then that side, one, two, three. And then these six screws go through. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now this one's got to flare up, so it wants you to go through one in the front and one in, well the manual says it's the bottom one, but I guess I've been using the middle one in the past, not to, not to worry. Okay, so that goes that way, and actually that goes like that down. And then that goes on like that. And now we'll start it off with the hand tools. And we will then finish off with the electric driver. Okay.
we forgot to do the wing support. And then tighten by hand so that you don't strip because the tool is on the weaker setting but it's still enough to do some damage. In these old soft plastics. Okay, that's enough. Only has to be finger tight. It's not coming undone. And then you put your longer 24mm screws through the back there. Okay, and then attach it to make the re-clip. To make it the re-clip. Okay, so that comes uh, through these holes. Okay, and then into the plastic like that. So we start with the hand tools. Then we finish, we continue with the power tools. And then finish with the hand tools. Okay, so the rear clip is looking more complete. 5.5 we're doing the rear arms and we are missing a couple of balls steel balls of the right size uh, we've got two the correct size this is not going to go well let's see what happens here all right so Let's get a real long swing shaft and what we'll do, we will put a bearing on it. And we'll get the other swing shaft and we'll put a bearing on that one. And then we'll get our bearing tool. We'll put a bearing on that one. So we're gonna put a bearing on the outside. Okay. And we're gonna put a bearing on the other side. Okay, clean our tools up. Now we're going to put our swing shaft through. That's nice. And then we'll put our swing shaft through the other one. That's nice. Now we're going to put some axles on. So to do that, what we do is we slide it on. 
and we have to get our grub screws ready because they're going to need Loctite. And then we put our pin. Put our pins through. And then we just push the pin through to the middle. Put our grub screw in with Loctite. Okay, when you feel resistance, hold it and turn. Okay, probably better if I use the 17 mil spanner, but let's trust that the Loctite will do the job. Okay, so that's one side. Okay, and now the other side, we're going to put, line up our holes, put the pin through. Okay, it goes to the middle. Put some Loctite on the set screw. Okay, let the Loctite dry up. Keep your Loctite bottle clean, keep the lid on. Okay, let's have a look at the picture. So the picture says, so this is the left one, which is this one, which means that's the left arm. So if that's the left arm, that's the back. So what we need to do is get the small shafts, which are these two, and we need two plastic spacers, okay, so it goes shaft, spacer, Oh right, we've gone straight through. So now we can put our little eclipse on. So small eclipse for this side. And then, oh, no. once that's on, oh, yo, yo. we have to do the top, it's called the camber link, or the top links, oh, okay? So the camber link or top links, these are the ones that need the balls, but I can't find the balls. All right, so what we might do, we might put the balls on the outside end here. Okay, because that's the left side. So what we'll do is we'll connect this up 
and it wants to go on the inside here. Okay, and the correct screw, the correct screw is 3 by 25. So we need to find a 3 by 25. And that is a cap head machine screw. 3 by 25 cap head machine screw. Now, I don't know, but I'm going to guess that that might be it there. 3 by 25. No, that's only 3 by 22. Even though that's a bit short, is it the correct screw? Because this manual is normally way off. Okay, so we're coming through the back straight through and then we've got to put straight the nut on so the nut just goes on all right so it didn't need to be 3 by 25 3 by 22 was sufficient okay so another classic example of the manual is crazy Alright, so that's the left side done. And now with the clip, we've got to go through with the long one. We should have dinner. It goes straight through. And then you put your large no, no, Eclipse no, no, no. on. No. Oh, no, no. Should we do a And then your large Eclipse go on. Now this one doesn't want to go in. Okay, you take you smash the tools or take them off you. Okay, we got that in. All right, let's put the eclipse on. Now these are the large eclipse. Where did that where did that go? I dropped it. Okay, large eclipse, hold it into position. Let's give it a squeeze. Snap. Did you hear it? Snap. And then on this side. We do the same thing, we put the large E clip on, get it into position, oops, we dropped it. Okay, we dropped it, get it into position, snap. Alright, so now if the dog bone goes into the diff out drive, that one should be able to snap onto there. Okay. Alright, so that's why we didn't need too much of these, because we're going to just snap those in into position. Okay, I don't seem to be able to be strong enough 
to do it. Oh, we got it. So that's the left side done. All right, so now we're just going to repeat it for the right side. So if that's on, what stops this popping off during the race? Well, they want you to put the washer and the screw and the lock nut. And which screw do you use? Aha! That's why they want you to put the long screw on there so that you can these don't pop off. Well, I reckon that's not going to pop off when you're running anyway. So I prefer to use the short screw and don't worry about using the aluminium washer and the lock nut. Each to their own. Step 5.5, it's referring to the pillow ball uh, setup, which is the also known as pivot ball. I think pivot ball is more correct. And uh, I don't know why it comes like that, but uh, that is not how the standard version looks, nor is the Pro R version looking like that. In fact, the only version that I know looks like that is the Paul Coleman Racing Edition. And I'm unsure if the UK Pro version uses this setup, but definitely the Australian Pro R version does not use this setup. So we just ignore that for now and we'll move on. 5.6 is the rear sway bar and uh, let's install that now with 3x8 flathead screw and alloy washers. So we get the rear clip, we put the sway bar over the universal drive shafts. Well, they're not universal, they're CVDs, they're CVAs, which are CVDs, and CV and, and dog bones are CVDs, and CVAs are CVDs. Now, why are these... No, they are not... Why are they flathead if they're going through something that's not flat? It doesn't make any sense. It's going to sit so weird. And it's going into plastic, so why are you using... Alright, so we put the alu washer on there. And see what happens. Let's see if that's correct. Okay, these are tapping. And they're button head. Through the alu washer. Yeah, that looks correct. Not flathead metric. Okay. And does that still move? Yeah, it does. And now we've got the rear stabilizer on with the aluminium washers. So next it's time to secure that stabilizer bar using the links and the stabilizer balls. We're going to put these balls into the links and then we're going to secure it with some long 20mm screws. So let's go ahead. We're going to use the shock pliers to put those balls on. To the bottom of the links. That's going to go on that side. That's going to go on that side. We'll start as per usual. With using hand tools. And then we'll finish with the power tools.
just do it hand tight. It's not going to come out. No chance. Okay, remember whenever you're putting metal on metal to use Loctite. So they don't back out. Maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll push these in with the pliers before we put them on. Otherwise, we might get in trouble here. Okay, so we've done up the little 1.5 grub screw to secure the restabilizer rod. And uh, I don't know, but I think this 1.5 millimeter tip is getting a bit round on the end because uh, this tool is now slipping inside the grub screw. So I might have to put this tip on the uh, the grinder and take half a mil off just to make it sharp again but uh, yeah set screws getting tight not a good thing step 5.8 is to have a look at your rear clip and make sure it looks like this which mine does and you can be proud of all that you've achieved because it's looking great and it's so well balanced. If you put it on to the out drive, it actually balances. You can even spin it. Such, such good balance. Step six is the center gearbox and brake system. Now I've already jumped the gun and I've already done it. Um, uh, what I can say is that this is the standard gearbox, standard as in twin brake, one and two, but my other Hyper 7 is the Pro R, which is quad brake, so it's got uh, another rotor, okay, so you can see it's got provision for two rotors, same on this side, provision for two rotors, so the Pro R has got one, two, three, four rotors, okay, whereas this one's only the, the twin. And the twin is more than you need, to be honest. But uh, you know, the problems with the, the quad rotor is that you actually need to use a smaller flywheel. So instead of using the 38 millimeter flywheel that this car will use, uh, you have to go down to a 35 millimeter flywheel if you're using the quad brakes. So I'll just glance over the instructions uh, since I've already put it together. And the other thing to note is that uh, I'm not actually using the gear diff that this manual suggests. I'm using a Torsen differential. And I've actually written it on there, Torsen, which uh, doesn't need silicon oil. It uses worm gears and uh, speed friction as resistance. And uh, you can download the manual for Hobo's Torsen diff if you want to see how it goes together. Um, we can move on to the, the bell crank. Okay, step seven is the steering bell crank. Uh, so you can see your post, your servo saver spring, and then you put your screw pins through, do them up with your washers, and then you attach your steering linkages. And then it looks like that, so let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so what we do is we start with the posts, post Malone, okay, and then we get this one upside down, 
put him there, put the spring on top, okay, and then this is your combination chow min. You've got your um, you've got your So you've got the long one and the short one. So on this side, you just put your bearing in there and then he goes on top like that. Put the bearing in the other side. Okay, so that's that side done. And then for this side, you've got your, your bushing. You've got your bushing cap, spring, okay, that goes to the right, that goes on top, like that, and then he goes on top through the whole thing, into there, Got your, your bushing on the top. Okay, so that faces that way. That one faces that way, like that. And then you've got your aluminium piece for the bell crank. Okay. And that goes on top here, you've got your pin uh, through through the steel. Okay, through that, and then you've got your washer underneath it. Okay, that goes through there, and then you put your little nut on the bottom, well you push your nut through first, like you always do, you push it through, and then, what size is this? 7.1, maybe we can do it up with him, yep. Okay, that's floating around nicely. Now, this guy here. So, my advice is, how tight do you do this up? If you're bashing with 4S or 6S electric, do it up hard so that you can turn. But if you're just mucking around with nitro on a, on a track, my servo is more important than, uh, than taking a turn at 115 kilometers an hour, okay? Because I'm only going to be doing 30 kilometers an hour maximum on a track. So I leave this as loose as possible. Okay, and if you notice you've got no steering, well, then you can do it up. Alright, so that's that side. And then same with the other side. You get your bolt, you get your metal collar, you put it through, you get your washer, and then you put it through your post Malone.
put your nut through get your 7mm So now you've got to put the balls into the linkages, okay? So it's one ball up, one ball down. Make sense? So if one ball goes up, if one ball goes up, then one ball goes down. See, one up, one down. One up, one down. Okay. Now, they attach from the bottom using the 3 by 15 millimeter flat head screw. 3 by 15 millimeter flat head screw. Screw comes in. With a little nut on top and a bit of Loctite.
then the same on this side. Comes up through the bottom, through there. Put your Loctite on. Do up your nuts. That screw even 3 by 15 and now the bell crank is finished step 8 chassis support post and bumper so first the bell crank goes onto the chassis then the front clip and bumper screws onto the chassis. Then we've got the body mounts go in and the steering tie rods connect to the knuckles. And then the chassis supports connect the front clip to the chassis. Step 8.1, we're going to put the bell crank on and we've already put the Loctite on our 4mm, uh, 4x8mm flathead steel screw. So we're going to come in from the bottom and, uh, and do that one up. Now it's quite weird because when you do this one up, it normally just spins forever. Uh, same as when you're undoing it, you get a lot of spinning. Yeah, you can see it's spinning. Sometimes it spins, sometimes it doesn't. I don't really know why. I guess just how quickly it grabs and gets friction from the, the post to the chassis. Anyway, there's tricks to undo these when the Loctite has gone hard. Uh, involving heat and getting one off and holding the posts from the top and undoing it from the bottom There's some tricks you can do but we're not here to pull this apart we're here to set this up right once and for all and uh, try and never get this dirty keep it clean for as long as possible so we don't have to do this again okay so we need 4 by 18 flathead tapping screws uh, to connect the front bumper 4 by 18 flathead tapping We've got the 4 by 18 flathead tapping We're going to secure the front clip and the bumper to the chassis And finally this car is going to start looking like a car should look So we've got our chassis Get the tie rods out of the way. Okay, put that underneath. Lift up. Slide that in. Bring that down until it clicks in. Alright, let's flip it over. See what's going on here. So, the aluminium goes into the hole there. And then our four holes are exposed 
Okay, so we go four mil into the plastic. Start by hand. Do the bulk of the work with the power tool. Look at that post my lens falling out. Finish it off by hand. One, diagonal. Two, diagonal. Three, diagonal. Four. Make sure that doesn't fall out. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, we're okay. Right, what's next? Next is the just before we connect this uh, top plate, just have a quick look at how different these knuckles are. We've got the right knuckle with this kind of squarish shape and this support, and then we've got the left knuckle which is, in comparison, it's uh, more round and doesn't have that straight support. It kind of swoops, swoops out. They're just so different, aren't they? Anyway, uh, who knows which one is original and which one I've replaced. And did I buy genuine parts or not? Don't know, can't remember. All right, so, You've got the top plate, we'll put the smooth side up and then you get your uh, 12 millimeter flat head tapping. Now I accidentally grabbed metric, so that's the 12 millimeter flat head tapping. Now why does it want flat head? if it's coming through a straight bit of metal. That doesn't make any sense. So why don't we just use a 12 millimeter button head tapping? That would make more sense. Since that's not countersunk anyway. So we'll come through the bottom. Yep, definitely you want a 12 there. Not, not flathead. Okay. Power tools. Put the correct tip. Okay. We need some grip. So let's use pliers on an angle. Got the tiniest little amount of teeth mark on there. Okay, it's not very tight. Let's finish it by hand. Okay, that's better. 
Then we get our four mil, four by 10 screws. And since that's going into plastic, we won't use Loctite. Since metal is going into metal, we will use Loctite. Okay, I can't say that that's actually biting at all. Where is that one is biting? Okay, what is going on here? Not even close. That's what's going on here. It is not even close. Okay, we got it on. Let's finish off this step, and that is to use these ones go on top through there. Go on top, through there, and you put your little nut underneath.
Now, if, if you're ever going to check something as part of routine maintenance, I suggest this steering knuckle is the one thing you check. Check everything on it. Check your kingpins. Check these little linkages. Just check, check, check. Okay, now with this knuckle, I noticed on this one, you put your nylock lock nut through the knuckle and do up your screw, but on this side, you clearly don't, it's a different design. Okay, so this one, the aluminium knuckle is threaded. Okay, so therefore, when you do up your links, the first thing we notice is that this screw that goes through, that's threaded. So that means once it's done up, there's no point tightening it anymore from the top. Okay, because you will just strip. Okay, so what you can do is you can put the Loctite on there and that's it. There's no need for a lock nut on the other end because you are screwing into the knuckle. So what we'll do is we'll back this out We'll put some Loctite on there, and then that's it, job done. Just a little dab. Just a little dab -a -roo. Dabby dabby dab. Just dab that in. Am I going to do this tight? No, I do not want to strip this knuckle. If I do, then I'll have to use a long screw and put a lock nut on the end, and I don't want to do that. I'd rather just do it finger tight and let the lock tight do its job. Okay, and the final step 8.4 is the torque rod, which is this guy here. And it's going to go through a flange ball that's in the chassis. And it's going to go on another flange ball, which is underneath the top plate, secured by that 14mm cap head screw. Whereas the flange ball here also uses 14mm, but not cap head. This one's going to be countersunk. Let's do that now. We'll get a 14mm countersunk screw. What is going on here? Can't reach that at all. Let's stop the camera and have a look. Well, that took me a while to figure it out. I put the uh, body support in the wrong one. It needs to go there. So let's swap these around. So if you can't do up some screws, and I was having some trouble getting these top plate screws in, here's a trick. Just loosen off your screws in the bottom, back them right out, get some thread into them, get them halfway done up, and then do up your bottom ones again, and then you'll be sweet. Okay, and then finally, we'll do our three by 14 flathead on the bottom.
Now that everything's done off, we can start to torque down. And the front clip, besides the shocks, is almost done. We've got steering. We've got drive. We've got suspension. A little bit of play there in the uh, HSP hex hubs. Step 8.5 is attaching the rear clip with the rear bumper to the chassis. I know it says front suspension, but that's a mistake. Clearly that's the rear of the car with the wing mount. And you're just using four of the four by 18 flathead tapping screw. So let's do that now. Get the rear clip. One, two, three, four, Okay, so I'm just going to leave these a little bit loose uh, because I have not attached the stabilizer rod yet uh, or the center transmission or the dog bones. So I'm going to leave it a little bit loose until I get all that in place and then I'll tighten it up at the end. Okay, so we're going to do the rear brace. It comes from the right side of the car. Okay, and then what it does is goes through here well, we're going to put the ball on first now did I put that ball on properly? I don't think so Yeah, that's on. Hmm. Hope I didn't just make a mess of that ball, of that plastic. Anyway, that goes on that side. Well, that doesn't matter which side it goes on. Uh, I guess this side goes down, so we might. We might push that down now while we're here.
Okay, so it goes uh, Spacer is next. Just back it off a bit. Get the spacer in there. And what we'll do, we'll get him through now. Okay, beauty. Then we'll put our lock nut on the end. Three mil lock nut. And we'll just do it up this way. Okay. And then this comes through the bottom with a bit of Loctite on it. Hold it with the pliers, otherwise you're not going to win. Let the Loctite do the work, don't do it up tight. Okay, so now that you've got the rear brace on, you can torque down these screws that you left loose from before. Snug. Don't strip this plast the plastic, just do them up till you feel resistance. Okay, so now we've got front clip, rear clip, all done up nice. Step 8.7 is to attach the center transmission unit and don't forget to place your dog bones correctly in there. However, we're not using dog bones, we're using uh, CVDs so we're gonna have to attach those first otherwise the step is going to be impossible so let's get our barrels and pins and put our CVDs in like we normally do So it goes uh, barrel through the shaft. And then it goes uh, in. And we put our pin through. Funny thing I noticed about these pins, there's no flat spot. There's, uh, there's marks where the grub screw has gone in, but there's no, no obvious flat spot. Wow, even that doesn't want to go in. Okay, something wrong with this pin. Oh, that's better. Whoa, that's a long pin. What is going on here? And I cannot see any thread there.
Is that a thread? Yep, it's threaded on both sides. All right, let's get a grub screw. We're gonna need a pretty fat one. Put our Loctite on the grub. Get a two mil driver. Loctite. Yeah, you do not want a grub screw coming out on you. It will make a mess of your CVD. Two mil, that's the right size. Everything should be two mil. Wow. That grub screw is not happy at all. I wonder what's going on here. Why is it not happy? So much binding. Okay, is the grub screw rubbing? Let's try this side instead. No not biting at all okay we'll try a different grub screw hopefully the different grub screw makes a difference if not we are in trouble Again, binding again. No grub screw, it's fine. What if I push the whole barrel? No, you can't because the pin's there. Okay, it's nice there. And then when I tighten it up, that's the problem when I tighten it up. If I leave it there, it's fine. So if I don't do the grub screw up, it doesn't bind. Bloody hell, but the pin's sliding out. Disaster. That is no good. We need a flat spot on the pin. And that pin looks too long. I mean, all the other ones all these ones have got flat spots in them. You know what I think? I think we're using the wrong ones. I think we're using wheel, wheel axle pins. Aha, these have got the flat spots. We've been using the wrong ones.
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so the trick for doing up these grub screws is put the pin through with the slot facing up to this hole here and then do it up. Don't try and do it up on that angle. Do it up vertical. That way you can see that the slot is lined up. So now that I'm an expert, this one should be much easier. Well, this one we can't even get to it. Anyway. Barrel. Through the shaft.
okay put the pin in and then as soon as you get the pin in push it out again and this time come back in on the flat So now you can see it's flat. Put your Loctite. Hmm. That hole is way too small. I think for this one, we're going to have to come in on an angle. Let's straighten the pin up. Oh yeah, that's fine. So we uh, manually move the pin to the flat side. No play. That Loctite will go hard overnight. Yep, that's nice. Okay, so we got front and rear ready to go. So now we can attach our center transmission okay with the pointy side facing forward and we only need four screws and that is four by eight millimeter flat head tapping so we'll get four of them one two three so all you got to do is make sure that your dog bones are in. And if they are, you are sweet. So all you gotta do Is line it up with your Loctite one drop one drop is all you need
What's interesting here is that there's no mention of the quad brake version in the manual, but then they go and show a picture of the quad brake center transmission. And then again, you can clearly see the quad rotors and the dual calipers on each side. Crazy. Step nine, side guards and fuel tank. So we've got the side guards and we've got the fuel tank. This fuel tank is actually very, very leaky. And uh, I tried to measure the O-ring. It's quite a fat O-ring. I would say it's a 2.4 or a 2.5. So 15 or 16, doesn't really matter if you get that wrong. 20 is critical, the outer diameter, to make a nice seal inside the tank. And uh, 2.5, nice and thick, 2.4. Make sure if you're ever buying an O-ring, it is nitrile silicon. Do not buy just pure rubber that's designed for water uh, because it will swell and crack and it won't last very long. Now again, the instructions don't match the parts. Maybe this car is a Hyper 7 TQ, I'm just not sure. But anyway, we'll uh, make do with what we've got. So it says 3 by 12 tapping and uh, that actually looks a little bit too long because it's sticking out through the bottom there and uh, does that matter? No, it doesn't matter if it sticks out. So if it doesn't matter, I don't care. Okay, so there's my 3 by 12 Doesn't sit nice at all, does it? What if I spin it around? What if I face it the other way? Ignore the instructions. Oh, much nicer that way. Sits much nicer. Okay, so let's put the other screws on. Well, I'm not going to put 3 by 12 flathead tapping. I'm going to put 3 by 12 button head tapping, aren't I? Okay, so is it 3 by 10 or 3 by 12? Which one would we use here? That's going to go through there. Oh wow, that is too long. Do not do that, you will crack. Do not use 12, use the shortest ones possible. We are going to destroy this fuel tank. 100% we need a screw that is only four or five plus two we need a six or seven millimeter screw only Okay, went through the spare parts box and I found these tiny ones. Not sure what they are, but they look like the correct ones. There you go, seven millimeters. 
by three, that will be perfect. Put that in there. Well, we're going to take that out first. Oh no, that's the right one. That one goes in there. That one goes in there. Yeah, I wonder what what I was using there. Was I using countersunk with a washer? I don't know. <coughs> anyway, that looks good to me. I don't know why I gotta use extra parts all the time for. So now that that's in, I guess three by twelve would be the correct size 3 by 12 button head tapping would be the correct size for the fuel tank supports okay that would probably go that way I guess that goes that way. Doesn't have to be really tight. I still want to be able to rotate it. Actually, you never want to do these tight. You want your fuel tank to resist vibration so you don't get air bubbles. Okay, and this fuel tank faces this way. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so then from the bottom, to secure it, it's 3 by 12 flat head tapping. From the bottom. Three by twelve flat head tapping from the bottom. I'll spin him around. We know he goes here.
Next, we're going to do these side guards. Now I'd like to take a man and just sit right there and I'll tell you what I really think about this engine mounting plate. Yes, it's great. Yes, it's highly adjustable. You can put small clutch bells, you can put large clutch bells. Changing the pinion changes the uh, how much torque you put down to the, to the track and uh, you need to be adjustable. However, 14 tooth clutch bells leave a lot of play and it's designed that way so you can put 15, you can put 16 tooth, you can put 17 tooth. And in my opinion, when the car lands hard on its left hand side, the engine can slide away. The engine mounts can slide on this mounting plate. Then your mesh is affected and you will destroy your clutch bell on this metal spur. I know you're supposed to use hardened clutch bells, but still, they will get destroyed if your mesh is out. So, on a metal spur, do not use a normal clutch bell. You have to use hardened. But in addition to that, I believe once your engine mounts have found the perfect location on your aluminium mounting plate, and you can see mine has got a shadow there because it's only ever seen a 14 tooth clutch bell. You should put something in there, like a, like a hole and a grub screw that goes through the mounting plate and stops the engine mounts sliding away from the spur. So I've never done this, just been an idea, a theory, uh, because there's not much real estate there. To get anything other than a tiny little grub screw it'll it'll stop the movement um, but if you're concerned that there's not enough real estate here 
you could also do it on the inside um, because the engine mounts are so high if you drilled a hole here or even removed some of this mounting plate and put a grub screw through the chassis it would also stop the whole engine sliding away because I mean let's face it you're going to put a 14 tooth clutch bell on your, your 21 engine and you're just going to leave a 14 on there if it wears out you're going to put another 14 on there you're not really going to chop and change every month are you um, I guess the racers will disagree but if you're buying a Hyper 7 you are not racing you are just bashing let's be honest Anyway, what did we come here for? We come here to put this mounting plate on. So we need four by eight flathead screws from the bottom with Loctite. Four by eight flathead machine screw with Loctite. We're securing the engine mounting plate to the chassis so that the engine mounts have adjustability and I am doing these up finger tight because there is nowhere for this to go once the Loctite is in. That plate is not going anywhere. Finger tight and lock tight. Uh, we need 3x12 from underneath the chassis to secure this box. Uh, I've run out of 3x12 tapping, so I'll just use 3x12 metric and see how we go. Hmm, doesn't really want to go in, does it? Two, three, four. Okay, well it's not ideal. Uh, a little bit harder to put in those metric screws in the plastic, but uh, they do go. Okay, so uh, the battery situation is next. Uh, which we are going to have to cable tie in double A's but I don't have a battery holder 
nor do I want to put in double A's at this stage. So I'll probably skip that step. Uh, servos is next uh, to the radio tray. Step 10.6 is the muffler stay, uh, which has a couple of pieces with a 4x8 flathead metric screw, which is going to go into here from the bottom with Loctite. Step 11.1 .1 is the battery box or receiver box. And when you connect your on off switch, always make sure that the on position is at the front of the car or the outside of the car. Because when you land on your side, you want the switch going to the on position. Or when you crash something in front of you, you want the switch going to the on position. You don't want it going off because then you could very quickly have a runaway if you don't have a mechanical fail safe like a spring. Step 11.4 and 11.5 is to put the arms onto the servos, make sure they're centered with your radio before you put them on. And I'm using an 11 kilo servo for steering, uh, Tower Pro, and I'm using a six kilo Hobeo for throttle, H103 and the torque will help with the braking but also the battery is a massive influence on your braking ability so that's why you use NLAMH because you have great brakes. Step 11.5 is to put the radio tray, servo tray uh, at the front so we're using the 11 kilo servo, stronger one for steering and the six kilo one for the throttle and brake. So what we do is we get these into position, okay, where we want them to go uh, by putting the wire through the top. Let it rest in there like that. So remember that one there is going to be pulling the carb open and that's for our uh, pulling the pulling on the brakes and then for the steering actually seem to get the steering servo in. Uh, is, there, is there a trick? Okay, so no more than 40 millimeters. Okay, so this is over 40 millimeters. Is it maybe too long? Okay, give it a bit of a push, and it's in. Now, with regards to the screws, the eight screws are the longer 12 millimeter ones. So they're the, the self-tapping, and they're gonna go into these plastics here. Now, it's probably a good idea to put a washer on each of these screws rather than just straight onto the supports um, because that'll give a bit of grip and look after the servo um, standoffs, bulkheads, lugs. But if we didn't, if we didn't do it, it 
it would go in the like of that. I just realized the lights are on. <clears throat> okay, now we've got lights. So, since this side is facing the fuel tank, and the center transmission. We want to keep the cables nice and managed. So what we can do is we can run the cable through here. Which is uh, some very classy cable management but I guess it's not too important to do that one since it's so close probably it's better to do it on this one well I didn't have to remove it all I had to do See that? That's where we're going to mount it.
Okay, that's in. So now that we've got steering and throttle, What we can do next is start connecting this up in its position, which is three screws from the bottom. secure these guys, these standoffs get secured on the bottom with 3 by 12 flathead tapping. Okay, now they're in. So there's supposed to be seven screws, three by ten button head tapping to secure this down. But 
but I've only got five. So I'll just do the critical ones. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Okay, so are we missing two? Ah, oh, okay, so the, the other two are for the sensor plate. But since we're not using uh, this for racing, then we don't need timing. So there won't need to be any, any sensor. So we'll just do up the fires and that completes the screws. Obviously we put our receiver in here, uh, digital receiver, or if we're using analog, make sure you put a fail safe in here as well, um, and a analog receiver with a fail safe and a throttle return spring is, uh, is a pretty good combination, uh, and an elastic over the car boot, so all three. Elastic over the car boot in case there's a linkage failure. Throttle return spring in case your battery goes flat uh, or disconnects. And a fail safe in case there is signal loss. Okay, step 11.7. We're connecting our steering servo to our bell crank. And the instructions say you want a 15 millimeter gap. Uh, between two pieces of plastic, well mine's 11 uh, but it seems fine, we've already got the balls in there and we've got our 15mm flat head tapping screw for both sides so all we need is our 3mm nut for both ends, blow lock, uh, lock nut so uh, the trick with this is to try and get the nylon, the nylon lock nut into position, uh, not like that. Then we'll finger the steering bell crank and try and get that nut in. Oh, in with my left hand too. Okay, so now that that's in, we'll get the screw and we'll put the screw through the ball. Okay. And I'm not letting go of that lock nut. No way am I letting go. Let's screw down quickly, quickly. Yep. We are in. Okay. How's that? We've got steering? Yeah, we do. I mean, it's very tight. Why is it so tight? That's not even the reason for the binding. It's something else. 
I wonder if it'll loosen up over time. It's probably just some Loctite somewhere. Anyway, uh, that goes on which side? Uh, it just goes on top with the nut underneath. So what we want to do is we want to hold that lock nut from spinning from the bottom while we do it up. Okay, and what happened there? Did you see that? The entire servo just came out. Unbelievable. The servo horn just came out. Never in my life would I have imagined. That that could happen. So easily. I mean, is it damaged? Well, if that doesn't go in one go, we are not using this steering servo. It does not look good at all. I cannot use this steering servo if that's going to fall out so easily. Well, just depends what we're going to do with this buggy. Check out the glitching. So, forward. Brakes. Now we're going to steer left. Look at the throttle servo reacting to my steering input, not touching the throttle at all. I'm only touching, see, no throttle, only steering, and the throttle is just going crazy by itself. What a shocker.
step 11.8 is to cut 50 millimeter rod for your throttle and two 60 millimeter rods for your brakes. Step 11.9 is to install those. Uh, we don't have the engine in yet, but we can still connect it all up. So let's slide off one stopper and put it through, orientate that the correct way, put it through, put your stopper back on. So imagine your carb ball is there. Okay, nip up that one. Now this side is supposed to be under a little bit of tension, that spring there. Okay, so what you do is you push the spring in. And then you do it up. It's got to be under tension. Okay, that's completely slipping, so we won't use that one. Try the Tamiya tools, they're not going to be any better. Okay, I was wrong, the Tamiya tools are better. Okay, so I think the stopper is faulty because uh, I'm not having any luck with any grub screw. So what I'll do is I'll change the stopper rather than continuing. Yeah, the stopper looks, looks damaged. Carb is on. Do up that one, and then I might better put some pressure, push it in. pulling your brakes on, the whole point of this being under pressure, okay, when you accelerate, the stopper hits, Okay, and pulls open the carb, and when you brake, when you go this way, it 
that spring pushes the carb closed. So you actually don't want this locked. You don't need a grub screw here. Uh, according to the instructions, you, d you don't even have a stopper there, you just have the spring. But uh, I've got the stopper there, which is going to be extra tension on that spring. So realistically, you only need the stopper on this side. Okay. Alright, now for the, the hard one. The twin brakes. which uses a ball stopper and our 60mm bent rods they're slightly curved and they curve away to the left towards the motor and the reason they do that is because in the original Hyper 7 there was a massive fuel tank splash guard that went all the way down to the chassis and these would hit either the fuel tank or that guard, one of the two. Uh, but by putting that slight bend in it, uh, that doesn't happen. Now, where do you put your little pieces of fuel tubing? Anywhere you want, so that the first pull of the throttle crushes these to give you a more progressive brake feel. Okay. So, what we'll do, since the only thing that goes on these, and since the bent side is closer to the servo, what we can do is we can put that on. can do it up okay so we can see the bend come through the bottom one come through there so as long as we don't hit that spur we are good if this hits the spur you've bent it the wrong way I mean, what's going to stop this rotating once it's once the car's going? You know, you don't want to bend it too much. Otherwise, if it rotates, it's just going to go straight into the spur. I mean, it, it really is a, a bad design. Okay, because I can make that hit the spur now. You know, that spur is rubbing on that ball ball stop and now it's rubbing on the grub screw terrible design pull to lock push I mean do you want to brake using your brake pads or do you want your your linkages going into your spurgy Terrible design. I have to say the brakes and the air filter are the two downfalls. Uh, I guess that's why on the TQ they changed the air filter design completely. Alright, so how are we going to solve this problem of going into the Spurgy? 
Uh, I'll show you what we're going to do. We're going to do some adjustments. So, not going to over tighten it, but that's pointing up and that's pointing up. So when you first grab a bit of brake, you're going to crush this fuel tube first. Okay, that's on the top and on the bottom one we're going to do the same thing. Put a bit of fuel tube. This is where you waste the most time putting the car together. It's always little things like linkages. So I'm going to orientate these the same way. Okay, so the bend is like that. And since I need to do this up, I'm going to put some pressure on it and then come in from a nice angle there. Okay, so when my Hobeo driver slips, I know I've done it up enough. Alright, so we said that this could hit this fuel splash guard. If it hits that, I'm going to move the whole brake cam towards the engine. If this one's hitting the spur, what I'm going to do is undo that. Okay, take some tension off. Then I'm going to bring the whole thing in. So now, my front brake is biting first and it goes into the fuel tank, which is bad, but it doesn't go anywhere near my spur gear when I accelerate. So which one do you want? Do you want it to go into your spur or do you want it to go into your fuel tank? Both are bad and this is a great way to put a hole into your fuel tank. Uh, which is why you need to use a digital radio and set your endpoints. Um, but, but adjusting this is the best thing you're going to do because you adjust So I think that's uh, good enough for now, I don't think we're going to be hitting, oh it's hitting the spur gear again, anyway we'll make a decision when we're about to put our radio in, um, we're definitely going to go digital, there's no way we're going to put an AM radio in this, um, that's if we're going to use it. So yep, let's finish off the next steps. It's time to connect the shocks. Uh, we use M3 by 20 flathead screw and the instructions say to snap the shocks into position 
uh, at the top first and then do the bottom with the screw last. So, in that case, we can see that this one was always on the front left because of the wear and this one was always on the front right well front left my right okay so that one was like that so if we're going to snap that into position I will need some magic super pants because these will hurt my thumbs too much and they say to remove these you just you just pull them towards you and they snap off which is why you can't have the screw sticking through there if the screw sticks through you'll never be able to pull it off Okay, so while we are snapping, we could do the rears, but let's just put these fronts in. Okay, so we use the inside holes, not the outside holes. Uh, the plastics don't give you much room, so this is not going to be easy. We're just hoping we can find the hole. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's in. I have no idea. Well, that was easier than I thought. Now, reshocks, does it matter which one goes on which side? Yes, it does. This one's got no paint on it, anodizing has come off because of the nitro fuel, so it'll need to go onto the muffler side over here.
Okay, so in the rear hole, it says to go into the middle one. So we will do what the book says. Okay, now there is not much left. Step 12.3 is to secure the wing. Check out this sticker. This is a vintage sticker. It says Hyper 21, which means Hyper 21 8 port. These are the stickers that came included. It says powered by Hyper 21, the powerful model engine gamut design and uh, yeah Herbeo sticking with the the pirate theme which they're famous for a lot of their models were called pirate back in the 90s and early 2000s uh, this is an original wing not many stickers on it I might have to put more stickers on this this is the wing that came with my first Hyper 7 Pro R in 2002 I bought it my boss at the time, Adam Molino from Audio Connection, bought one as well. Apparently his neighbour had a hobby shop in Castle Hill. So we bought two at the same time. Starter boxes. Uh, glow igniters. Lots of stuff. Aluminium washers. Now I don't have 3x14 cap head screws, but I've got 3x16. Let's see how we go with those. We're going to need 3mm nylon lock nuts. Because under the wing, under the wing is where you secure these in here. Put the little lock nut in there. Can you see that? Can you see that in there? You put the lock nut in that little gap there? Let's try. Cap head, aluminium washer. Two point five mil driver. Let's stick this son of a in sideways. We got him in there. Put the screw in. Turn. And pray that it grabs. Is it grabbing? Not at all. Let's give it a massage. With a happy ending. 
good. That's in. And we'll do the same for the other side. Put it in first. Put it all in. Oh, I think that's in. Yeah, for sure that's in. Okay, that's not coming off. It's not one, it's lock nut. And I mean, you don't lose your wing, do you? Okay, uh, that's looking great. Three by 12 tapping, four of them. One, two, three, and that's not even tapping, that's just metric. Will it work? Yes, it will. All right, so I won't do those up, there's no need. And uh, other than that, it's just a matter of putting the wheels on and uh, the body shell, and that's it. That concludes, uh, because I don't have any engines here right now, they're all downstairs. And the final thing is Hyper 21 Turbo. <clears throat> turbo doesn't mean turbocharged, but there is a boosting mechanism in the way they've got a patented fan boosting mechanism in near the back plate um, apparently creates a bit of extra pressure but uh, pressure is useless as we know in the two-stroke thanks for watching all right now that it's warmed up a little bit we're back in the garage and uh, we can start installing some engines all right so we've had this in storage for a while uh, with the piston at uh, BDC and the carb fully exposed. Hopefully that's fine. Oh yeah, nice and wet. Um, I don't think I use any after on oil, but that's fine. All right. Everything's nice and clean, it seems. Yep. Oh, nice stinger. All right, so these kind of pipes are the best, I've been told, because uh, you use the springs, not just a rubber silicon coupler. So, we need some screws to put the engine into position. That's nice. Still got a bit of, uh, a little bit of meat left on those teeth. Everything's good here. No issues. In a, uh, in a factory position, nice rich position. All right, let's attach our engine. Time for the final few steps. We have to reattach the engine with our pan head or eye screws as they're known. You don't have to use these. You can use countersunk screws with countersunk washers and that will give you more bite. And uh, then we put our, our muffler with our little little three-piece springs. And uh, these are better than the silicon coupler because the springs do a great job of keeping 
the manifold in place. Just attach the uh, fuel hoses and then we'll start tuning. So I get everything roughly into position first before I put any springs anywhere. I've got my springs ready and I've got my spring attaching hook tool. Ahar, me hearties. Get your tools ready. Um, this didn't cost me much. Uh, you know me, I don't spend much money. Bought it probably um, from a local hobby shop or if not AliExpress um, and yeah this will get you out of trouble instead of using plies and destroying your springs sorry I couldn't record me putting these springs on but uh, the uh, little iPhone has run out of storage so I have to use the big iPhone so just a matter of putting the spring on one side and then pulling it back lowering it into position and letting the spring go and now we're ready to put the engine into the chassis we got the uh, engine mounted in, we've put the uh, pipe back into its pipe holder, we've routed in some fuel tubing, uh, we've put the fuel filter back in, noting the direction, uh, the arrow points to the direction of fuel flow and uh, the gauze is on that side as well on the left. The gauze is the mesh which is going to catch any large particles that make its way past the stone filter that's built into the tank. Personally, I don't believe anything could get past that stone filter. Um, it's just amazing. But uh, yeah, I think we're done. I took the terrible blue hexes off because there was too much play and I had to order some shims because there was too much play. But now that I've got the original Hobeo back on, check it out, there's hardly any play at all. And you don't even want to remove that play, I've been told. Otherwise, you start destroying your bearings. So we've got the stinger wrong. We've got all the fuel tank routed and zip tied up now. Uh, all that's left is for me to do up these last few uh, grub screws, tighten the engine bolts, and uh, we are ready to start this up.